one. You are live, you are live. Good morning and welcome on the Sunrise Safari. We're on the run at the moment. The lion's roaring everywhere. We're trying to figure out. We've got trucks down there. We've got audio over there. So we're just trying to figure out where they are. And hopefully, it sounds like the Birmingham boys are back in residence. So very exciting. My name's Brent Gersmith. I have Andrew Joseph Francis on camera. We have Brian Joubert, James Henry, and Stefan, the winter farmer, or winter boer, on bushwalk this morning and Jamie's out on the tracking team. We have Kirsten and Geraldine in final control and everyone out there say a big happy happy birthday to Geraldine. It's her birthday today so we're going to try to be nice to her I promise. I'll try, I can't guarantee but happy birthday to Jerry. No tracks here. The last track was on Twin Dams Road. I'm hoping they pop out here. If not, we're going to have to scoot around and start again. And that is not a lion. That is an impala. And they're looking quite relaxed. And with James and Steph out on the walk, if they hear those lions roaring, they can let me know so we can switch off and see if we can hear them too. Thanks to all the Jimmy junkies who are watching the Dan Cameron giving us updates on the, the Lions, Chris Rogue, Kevin Catfish. Morning, boys. We'll look at you later. We've got Lions to find. It is a chilly 19 degrees or 67 Fahrenheit. I know a lot of you out there will think that's just balmy weather uh, for us people who live in the heated low felt of South Africa. It's quite chilly. Now, decision time. Do we take a little two-track along the drainage line or do we check the business? There's a chance at male lions in Birmingham. You haven't seen them in a while. Last time I actually saw a Birmingham male was with the Inkahumas and feeding off of that young buffalo that they caught around Buffalo's Hook. So Andrew, Andrew's looking very bright and bushy tailed this morning, scouring the savannah sight of one of these Birmingham boys. For those of you who might be new viewers and just joining us, the Birmingham boys are the dominant coalition of male lions we get in this area. There are five of them and they are quite impressive beasts. If you would like to know a little bit more about the Birmingham's, feel free to drop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Always exciting when the air is vibrating with the sounds of the lions. as a church mouse when you want them to be as loud as the church choir. The sun's about to pop up and it is an absolutely spectacular morning.
Houston, who's 13 years old, is busy working on his bird list. And he said he'd like to know, to start, how many birds he should have. And Austin, I think, if I remember correctly, um, there's a possible sort of 350 species for this part of the world. <clears throat> a lot of those and we're probably not going to get. So I would say let's, let's start on 300, and anything above and beyond 300 is a bonus. Austin um, is 13 years old and getting into the birding game at a, at, at a nice young age. Hopefully, Austin's going to be able to build a very impressive list by the time he's finished. So, guys who watched the Juma down town, there were tracks heading in that direction. So, keep an eye out in case they pop out there. And you can let me know, and we can have a place there to find you those lions. Nice to have a spy at the water hole, so to speak. just to add a spanner into the works. Not only do we have the lion tracks, but we have the tracks of Queen Karula. There we go. She's heading back towards the den site. And some of that lion audio is coming from that area. Hopefully they haven't found her. We are still quite far from the den site, but the general direction straight east is towards there found that cub about 10 days ago. I'm quite sure Queen Karula is an expert at evading lions. But Michelle is wondering how far does the lion's call, the sound of a lion's call travel? Well, Michelle, it can, we can probably hear it um, depending on the wind and whatnot for up to about 15 kilometers but to really hear it close I would say all the audio we've been hearing this morning is within five kilometers so quite close and if you're a lion you can probably hear it from even further. Now speaking of things you can hear from afar let's jump on foot with the Commander Bond. And from the distance, from afar, my voice travels to you over the internet via Brian, who is on camera today, 25 feet tall with the aerial on his back, and you're looking at a helmeted guinea fowl. Well, now you're looking at me, of course. My name is James Henry. We're on foot today. Marvellous time to be on foot. It's a beautiful, cool morning. Behind me, the sun has just peeped up over the horizon. Not quite so gold as it normally is. A blinding orange more this morning, soon to be fairly blinding white, I suspect. It's going to be a, a scorcher out here. Uh, we are on Bushwalk Live, as you are on Live Game Drive with Brent, and so please do talk to us. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, questions at wildearth.tv if you want to talk to us on the email. And our plan today is to just sort of potter about, see what we can find. Brent did mention some lion tracks. He's gone sort of off that direction to see if he can hear. Listen. You won't be able to hear, but there are two, at least two groups of lions calling. He's going off to try and follow up on the lions that we heard to the east of us now. He found some tracks earlier just down there, so we're going to walk over there and see if we can't find where those tracks went. And during the course of the morning, we'll have hopefully some kind of clarity as to where all of this lion activity is. With any luck, it's taking place on Juma, here in the northeastern corner of beautiful South Africa. Are you ready? I'm ready. Brian, are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. So the helmeted guinea fowl will be pottering about here trying to find something nice to eat. They're ostensibly seed eaters but they will definitely eat insects if they can find them. Um, sort of 
Yes, yeah, so I guess they're kind of omnivorous, but if you, there's one over there that we can, oh here, yeah, let's just look at this one, Brian, if you don't mind. That one there was just, if you watch them, they dig around with their feet for a while, especially if they find some elephant dung, and then they'll try and find little invertebrates or seeds that may be caught up. Now, of course, if you're a seed-eating bird or an insect-eating bird, it's not easy out here during the drought. Hello, Austin. I think you're 13, or your Twitter handle is Austin13. I'm not sure which it is, but you're starting your bird list today. Perfect bird to start with your bird list is the helmeted guinea fowl bathed now in glorious African dawn light. You want to know how many birds you should have on your bird list? At least 7,500 by the end of this walk today. If you don't have that, you can consider yourself a failure. That is. That's nonsense, of course. We have a total bird list here, Austin, probably including vagrants, and vagrants are birds that might come in once, you know, sort of very unusually come in once and then disappear again. I'd say in this area of around about 300 at the outside maximum. So if you can get anything close to above 180, I'd say you're doing exceptionally well. So keep at it, especially, I mean, if you lived here and you could spend a bit of time looking for birds rather than trying to see them through their camera, which is uh, birds are one of the most difficult things to film, then 180 is pretty good. If you lived here, like I say, I think a bird list around this area of around 230 would be pretty good. Watch that large rock there, Brian. So we're walking past the fireside chat area, and I'm not sure we've had lots of new viewers since we had a fireside chat, but that's where we do our fireside chats sometimes. <laughs> Brian, does the thumb come on the walk? No. The Brian, the, the thumb is very lazy about how, where, how and when he comes on drive. He prefers to sit on the back of the vehicle. He finds walking very tiring, does the thumb, so he's not on drive at the moment. The other reason, of course, is that Brian has to hold the camera with both hands at all times when we are walking. I'm just going to turn this radio off. There we go. It's the game drive radio, which we'll keep um, monitoring periodically. Now, look around here. If we look around this area here, you can see how the trees have been completely smashed up by elephants. This is totally typical of a drought and not a bad thing. So a lot of the time you'll hear people come in. Let's go and have a look at this one, Brian. You'll hear people come in, see this kind of destruction and really I know it looks kind of negative, but it isn't. It's perfectly normal. It's perfectly natural for us to have a drought. And because of that, the dynamic equilibrium or the balance between trees and grasses changes all the time. And that's as a result of things like this drought. Lions calling. Well to the south of us, I'm afraid. amazing. Anyway, so the trees like this will take a hammering during a drought and that's part of the natural cycle of things out here. It's what we call a dynamic equilibrium where there's no kind of climax, there's no kind of situation of an ultimate health of the bush. It's a continually changing, fascinating sort of world of discovery out here. Right, let's head back across to Brent. He's now in the east following up on those lions we're going to head a little bit south and follow up on these ones and see what we can find. See you shortly. So I'm literally vibrating with excitement at the possibility of finding one of these male lions. The tracks seem to have ducked into the Mwati, the river system that runs through the centre of Juma. So we're going to loop across the Juma Dam wall and uh, hopefully get the tracks on the other side. Jamie has skedaddled off to the far east where it sounds like the rest of those males are bellowing for good measure. I'm waiting for an update from her. Hopefully they are still on Juma. Definitely sounded to all of us like they were. But she said the audio now sounds like it's getting further away. Are they on the move? Are they heading back east?
Georgie, you are very correct. Georgie has popped me an email asking about uh, one of the Inkakuma lionesses, uh, and it looks to be Amber Eyes, who's mating with the Birmingham boys, sort of hoping that on this vast open area we can sort of see that male lion in the sphinx pose in the early morning light. But alas, not this morning. termites feeding and what happens is they go snip all the grass and they carry it through to the holes and there's literally oh what's that moving there to the right there we go they're closing up the hole <laughs> isn't that fascinating you just see that little bit of movement so what happens is that abandoned grass at the entrance did not pass the quality control check so there's a, a couple of termites will sit there and go, oh, no, no, that's not good enough to use. Throw it away, throw it away. And that's why you find these little piles of grass. Absolutely fascinating. So they've been busy. And you can see there's actually three or four of these different little group things around. So there's two there, another one there. And that's a big one. But if I had to look around, we'd probably find quite a few more. shopping it's now over now we've got a decision to make do we stick on these tracks or do we head out for the rest of those lines we're going to do a combination of the both we're going to head straight down the center of juma on central road i think that lion might have possibly listened to his friends and changed his mind and decided to start heading back east. Isn't this just spectacular? Look at this light. No way else I'd rather be right now but on the Sunrise Safari.
and there we go. There we go, update from Craig. They have found two of the Birmingham males to the south on a property called the Nets. So those are probably the lines that uh, James heard. Uh, James, for me, is actually west of me at the moment, and I'm heading east towards the rising sun. in the east yet. So that's. So Jamie is sitting on our eastern boundary listening. And see if she can hear them. She's standing by Gary Main Junction with Cheetah Cut Line just listening for now. Uh, I haven't looked for any proof of tracks yet. There's tracks of a single male on Twin Dams quite close to where Teller. They duck north into the drainage and now checking central. boy is just lying up in the drainage but we're gonna extend our search radius a little bit but just before we do that I just I mean look at that marula I mean marula trees are beautiful but if we zoom in and have a look at that marula next to the road with the, that golden light coming through isn't that absolutely spectacular There we go, lines. That sounds like on... Those are the lines to the south calling, not the same ones that were calling to the east, so we're going to continue on. But let's just wait a second to see if the others respond. So quite often, when you hear a male lion calling, the others will respond. Standing by, James. Fermi, uh, James, Jamie's in the area that's uh, south of Gary, Main. I'm just standing by to see if there's any reply audio. They've located two uh, Birmingham's on a net. In this turn. Oh, the lions are not playing along. They're supposed to respond with gusto. Well, let's carry on. And even if we don't find just that amazing sound of male lions giving it horns, it's definitely one of the best sounds to hear out here in the African bush. in Lee's 
Pittsburgh. Very good morning and welcome on the Sunset Safari. Uh, yesterday on the Sunrise Safari, Ben asked me about predator hierarchy. And I said there was only one animal that can rival lions for that top little triangle of the trophic, uh, the trophic levels. And I forgot to go into detail about it, so Ben would like a bit more information. So the other dominant predator, lions are the dominant nocturnal predator. The other dominant predator out in the African savanna is the human being. And it's a very interesting discussion because obviously in the last couple of hundred years we've um, our technology and stuff has evolved very quickly. But before that, when we were living on the savannas, we were direct competitors with the predators. And that's why if you walk into lions and, and leopards and even elephants and things uh, during the day, they will often run away. And it's because they recognize that bipedal figure of man as, oh, sorry. Some Mattel Franklin making noise. And, nope, sorry, I thought I heard something. Um, and they will actually run away because that bipedal figure of man is, represents the dominant diurnal predator. And there's quite a few interesting theories out there. So from fossil records and whatnot, modern day human beings, Homo sapien sapien, which is us, and Panthero leo, which is the lion, evolved into our current forms around the same time. So it's, it's very interesting that lions are the only social cats. And there's quite a few things that stipulate that lions are social because we are social. As a direct response to having to compete with uh, social predators, ice and hyenas being in particular. And it is really, really amazing that so at night time, we want to get into our caves, we want to get safe. And that's a direct response of trying to hide from lions. And then during the day, lions will actually run away from us. And one of the reasons we developed this incredible cooling system of being able to sweat and all that is that so we can operate at the heat of the day. And there's very few animals that can operate at full sort of capacity really hot climates and human beings are the only one and now that is our way of having not to deal with lions uh, lions during the heat of the day are generally very flat they don't move around they're not really hunting so we are able to dominate that niche and lions dominate the nocturnal niche uh, very very interesting and sorry i forgot to explain that bit but better yesterday on the sunrise safari ben And speaking of bipedal humans, the dominant diurnal predator scouring the savannah, let's see what James is up to. Hello everybody, I'm just sneakily walking down here to see if I can spot a white brown scrub robin. Now there are three of them calling, one there, one there, one here. And the call at the moment is just a... I used to think that was an alarm call, but I don't think it is anymore. I think it's some kind of different communication that they make. They will often do that um, sort of late at night, just before dark. Anyway, it stopped. I was hoping we'd be able to show it to you. But they're very secretive little birds of the white-browed scrub robins. Now, Brian, I'm not sure if you can see in there, there's a little nest, a little web, sorry, of a tropical tent web spider. And I think if, if we get any closer, it'll become almost invisible, but it's shining quite nicely in the sun. Are you able to see it? It's almost impossible. Should we go closer? Let's try and get it a bit closer. It's just without the light shining on it, it's almost invisible. It's the most intricate lattice work of weaving that you can imagine. I'll point my stick up at it. 
I've not lost it. <laughs> I can't see it from the side. Wait, hang on. You got it. Well done. Ah, okay, I've got it now. Now, so while I'm trying to show you this tropical tent web spider, it's totally invisible from where I'm sitting, so you can see it now, right, Brian? Can you see it? Yeah. It's just there. I can. The only reason that I know that it's there from this angle is because I've watched it from the other side. I can barely see it. And there's a tiny little spider in there, possibly sitting in. There's a little conical sort of nook in the middle of the nest. And that's where the spider will be sitting. And what... It's, it's an amazing thing. I mean, it's incredibly intricate, obviously, you can see. It looks almost like a, like a flat wo woven piece of cloth that's sort of been shaped in a conical manner. But on the top of it here, these little bits here are called knockdown threads. So what happens is a hapless insect flies along enjoying the morning sun, and then it hits one of these knockdown threads, and those knockdown threads force or make it fall out of the sky and then it drops into the net below a bit like a sort of trapeze artist falling down into the net that looks after them and then obviously things get worse for the little insect because they were normally then bitten by the spider venom will inundate their bodies they will die and then be eaten but the spider has to eat now Siberia Zumi I'm not sure if you can hear. You hear all of the go away birds going quay, quay, quay. It's often an alarm call. So we're going to head down in that direction and see if we can't pick up what they're shouting at. While we're going, Siberia Zumi, you say you want to see an arena trogan on safari. Now, you also want to know what it sounds like. Why are we waiting to see? There's a dike, it's going running off there. I don't think you'll get it. Well, we're waiting to see what those um, just listening to some lions. Still calling from the south. It's just while we're waiting for those luries to call again or grey go away birds, I'll play you the call of the Narina trogon. You're not going to see an Narina trogon here. That's what it looks like. It's a beautiful, beautiful bird. They're not found here. I'll show you where they found. That's where they found, or well, in theory, you could see them here. They have been spotted every so often on the permanent rivers in the Kruger National Park, but so Juma, not so much. I think they were actually seen on the Sand River not too long ago around Londolozi, and I'll play you the call. Not a particularly attractive call. Anyway, that's the Narina Trogan. Thank you, Siberia Zumi. Right, let us press on. The go-away birds have stopped saying go away. Hello, Gwen. You're on Twitter, tweeting like that. White-browed scrub robin was, and you want to know if the violet-backed starling is the same bird as the plum-coloured starling. Gwen, they are exactly the same bird. The name is now officially the violet-backed starling, although some of us still use the term plum-coloured because it's such a nice term. Um, the reason they've all changed, or so many of the names have changed over the years, is that different birds or the same bird species are found in various parts of the world and they are called different things and it's an attempt to make to sort of standardize things so for example the grey go-away bird used to be known as the grey luri now luri is an afrikaans term and so only understandable in south africa and so it was changed to the grey go-away bird all the other luri species are now terracos so just an example of how they've tried to kind of standardize the nomenclature of the birds around the place. I've got a feeling that something's going on in this block. Right, now 
Our security detail, Mr. Stefan Winterboer, has spotted something. I suspect it's a buffalo. What was it? Luri. Ah. Come over here, Brian. There's a raptor. That's what the Luris were shouting at. So can you see it? If you come to the side, Brian, I think you need to come further to the right. You see the farm marula there? You got him. Now this will be a hell of a shot for Brian because that bird is a substantial distance from us. I'm just going to try and identify it. My initial thought is tawny eagle, but I can't see properly from here. Well done, Brian. Brian, you probably, your super zoom's probably got a better look at it than I did with my ancient binoculars. Oh, I'm going to guess tawny eagle. We'll, we'll get, try and get a little bit closer. What do you think? We'll try and get a little bit closer. Brilliant stuff. OK, well, while we're sneaking closer to that large bird, Ginny, you're in North Carolina, and you want to know about mosquitoes and whether we get them here. We don't mention them too often. Sorry, Courtney, not Ginny, Courtney. Courtney, um, we do get plenty of mosquitoes here. Mosquitoes are abundant residents of this area. Some of them fairly dangerous because they carry malaria. Others, not so much. Malaria is a low, this is a low risk malaria area, but it is a malaria area. Um, we don't mention them much because, well, they don't really affect us out in the bush. You know, they affect us in our rooms, but we don't see them hugely in the, in the bush. And they certainly, I don't recall ever receiving a mosquito bite in the bush. I received plenty while in my quarters. Right, there's the bird. It's not a tawny. I think it's the pale form Wahlbergs. And the way you can see that, everyone, is from the tiny little crest that comes up from the back of its head there. That's brilliant. There we go. Definitely a pale form Wahlbergs. Its nest, there are two, well, there are three pale form Wahlbergs that live around here. Two of them in a couple, and one of them who lives with a dark form, or dark morph Wahlbergs. And then there is the bane of anybody with the Johannesburg hangover just below the bird there. See on the ground, Brian, if you look, there's some hardy dar ibis there, fossicking about underneath that fallen combretum tree, bush willow. And the hardy dar ibis is well known in Johannesburg for getting up very early in the morning, sitting on your roof and going, And if you've been drowning your sorrows at the fact that you work in a bank or a legal firm on a Friday night, your Saturday morning can be infinitely worse with the hardy dar ibis going <coughs> outside your window at 0500. Let's try and get a little bit closer to that eagle. Um, an interesting Twitter handle name here, Pizzas, Pizza, not sure. Uh, you want to know about bustards and whether we've seen any, oh, pizzazz. If we've seen any lately, pizzazz, we haven't seen any bustards lately. You're right, they make the most wonderful call that Brian is able to do. Brian, you need to flick your cheek, don't you? Mm. Brian makes the brilliant, brilliant, brilliant rendition of the black-bellied bustards call. Right, there are the... Hardy Dar Ibis, They're looking very shiny in the morning light, not to be confused with the glossy Ibis, which looks fairly similar. And they're sitting right under the tree where the Wahlberg has gone as he flown. I think the eagle has flown. And the squirrels are alarm calling now, I think because that bird has flown. 
All right, well, we're going to carry on down this sort of nice clearing here and towards Twin Dams Road. Let's head across to Brent, get an update on his tracking for the morning, and we will catch up with you, hopefully, with something exciting shortly. So Jamie's checked the whole of the eastern boundary. It sounds like those lines that were shouting are out of our reach, unfortunately. But there is still that track down around Twin Dams, and I think James is on his way there now. And we are going to go do the same, but also I might go check the last position of the Inkaruma Bride. And while we head towards that area, uh, we, we are taking one of the main arterial roads through Juma does pass relatively close to where karula has got a den and we'll just check for tracks as we skim past. and they'll be very quiet and, and very sleepy and they'll just generally rest especially when they're young they're going to be sleeping the majority of the time sort of 21 22 hours a day and only the two hours where mom's around will they actually be quite active oh, there we go another update here yeah. sorry just one second i'm listening to the game drive radio Another two Birmingham's have been found to the east of us, also on their way south, back towards where those others were calling earlier. So that means there's one still missing. They've bombshelled in all different directions. They're all five were together yesterday. I just want to be on the radio for a second. Uh, and we, there was audio to the east of sort of Pepper Pools Junction with the Cheetah Cut Line earlier this morning. check uh, the last place where all five were together and there is a possibility and we've seen it before that those line tracks were following is that that male's walked in and walked out before in between the drives uh, hopefully not but it is a possibility uh, male lines can do some serious distance when they're on the move up to about 20, 25 kilometers in the night if they have to. Uh, they don't normally do it, they normally do about between two and five. So we saw Queen Karula's tracks a little earlier this morning heading back towards this area. Uh, we're just gonna bypass here quickly check if the tracks are still heading to that same den site if that's the case on we go and as everyone knows we're not going to be going in there for quite a while giving her a chance and the cub or cubs a chance 
to get settled, get a little bit bigger. Whoa, Craggy boy. Morning, morning, Craig. Good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing? Blind, blind no, other way, other way. Other way. Yeah, Craig's trying to hide in there. It's hide in my shadow. How are you this morning? Doing well in yourself. Blind's causing trouble in my life, of course. Oh, Roaring everywhere, yeah, but everywhere sick. I can't go. <laughs> but not for too much longer. No, hopefully not. Yeah. Not for too much longer. Not for too much longer. Um, anything on those other tracks any north? No, I think it's done a in out. Sneaky number. Yeah, Jamie's checking now. And then uh, Karula's tracks were heading down uh, Pangolin, Pangolin track, but straight back into the drainage, so. Uh, okay. Are you saying Kunza 4 or Karula's heading back to? Straight back into the drainage, yeah. Okay, well, that's fine. Oh, I'm going to leave OB. Yeah. yeah, tax is coming back today, so. Brilliant. All right. Okay, so while we continue on, let's jump back on board with James, who's Cheers, guys. on Shank's pony. Bye, Craig. <laughs> Right, we've just snuck around this marula tree to get a better view of this Wahlberg's eagle. Beautiful pale form Wahlberg's eagle. You can see the brown wings, lovely white breast and white head, and the slightly reddish eyes. And if you can see that, depends on the resolution of your screen, I suspect. And also that little white crest. Now, that eagle stands at probably just over a foot tall, so not a very large eagle. And certainly one of the most common eagles we get here in the summertime, but they will head off north into equatorial Africa and a little bit beyond, probably at the end of next month. But they're certainly one of the eagles that come back the soonest. So they'll normally be back by August time. But I just wonder if they're not going to leave a bit earlier this year because of the lack of rain. Now, if Brian zooms out of the bird, this marula tree is not in the state that the marula tree should be at this time of year. The leaves are wilting. They're all kind of folded over to avoid losing water. It, this tree doesn't want to lose any water that it can possibly avoid losing. And so as the sun comes out these days, the leaves are going to fold over the stomata, which are the little cells or the openings on the top of the leaves through which transpiration happens, will close up and it will really go into a kind of um, maintenance state where it's not quite dormant. It is still making carbohydrates through photosynthesis, but that process will be slowed down a lot because it obviously can't get as much water as normal. And normally in summer, I don't think we'd be able to see this bird in the tree. I think that the foliage would be so thick and so open that it would be almost impossible. Wonderful shot there from Brian. I'm just going to sneak around him. I can't actually see what he's looking at. That is amazing. Isn't he lovely looking down at us? And I think he didn't fly away because we just kind of walked up in the open, slowly snuck up and started looking at him. We didn't behave like predators, and I know that Brent was talking about us as the apex predator of the area. And it's amazing how certainly he's correct. All the animals out here do see us as an apex predator or as a predator. But if you don't behave like a predator, Animals don't tend to te become, be nearly as terrified of you as they might be. So if you just walk through a clearing as opposed to sneak from bush to bush, animals are much less likely to react to you as if you were a predator. Look at that <laughs> raised foot there. It's fluffed out chest feathers. We once retrieved a Wahlberg's Eagle Czech fledgling that had come out of the nest but couldn't fly yet. And the parents abandoned it for some reason and we took it back to the lodge where I was working and fed it a bit and gave it some... One of the guys was quite interested in getting into falconry and we thought, well, he can look after it. And he was a walking guide and he took it down to his walking camp. And for a couple of days it sat in a tree just outside his tent and he'd give it some meat 
mixed with baboon hairs or whatever kind of hair that he could get because they need the hair to help them, help the digestive system. And in three days, the bird had gained enough strength and just flew off and became independent almost immediately. Hello, Johnny Rook. You're asking about the membrane that goes across the eye. And I think it's a throwback to their reptilian past, really. It's, an, it's a membrane that goes across the eye and cleans the iris without them have, actually having to close their eyes. And I think all the reptiles have got something similar. Well, the snakes don't, of course, but many reptiles do. We don't. And I think it's just a throwback to that. That's all I know about it, I'm afraid, Johnny Rook. I hope that's what you were looking for, but if there's something else you'd like to know about it, we can try and do some research and find that out for you. Okay, we're going to leave this eagle to himself, himself or herself. I'm not sure which. <laughs> he looks very insulted that we're leaving him. And we'll hand you back to Brent. Not sure exactly where he is at the moment or what he's doing. Sounds to me like all the lions are off the property. But until we see you next, enjoy your chat with Brent. So we've left that area around the east due to the fact there are zero lion tracks there. And we're going to head now towards the west to the last position of the Inkwoma Pride. Uh, those male lion tracks in Trindam seem to duck and dive and disappear outside of our traverse area. But for every track that leaves, there must be a track that comes in. So hopefully we will find one of those shortly. to Rachel from New Jersey who would like me to find her a unicorn on this drive. Uh, Rachel, give me I just need to find a specific thing and I shall find you a unicorn. It may be a little bit longer than three seconds. one shortly, I hope. Uh, Andrew, take the camera off, away, put it in the sky. We cannot show people how we find unicorns out here. Andrew, what are you doing? I said keep the camera away. It's away, it's away. Mystery must continue for a little longer. I need to get some tools out of my box. But uh, we will keep driving while we look for this mysterious unicorn. So here at Safari Live Retro, we even are able to create mythical beasts such as unicorns. It just takes a little while. I need to speak to uh, the witch doctor and the spirits and get them to conjure a unicorn for me. Ah, you're all wondering what I'm up to. <laughs> <laughs> You're not allowed to see it yet. Okay. Now, uh -huh. what else do we need? Andrew, what else do we need? What do we have in this box? What do we have in this box? There we go. That's what we need. Okay. 
And look how pretty that marula tree is. Okay. Okay, there we go. Um, we found a unicorn. A combination of uh, Brentley O. Smith and uh, a, a large <laughs> acacia tree. So there we go. We have a unicorn. There we go, Rachel, just for you. You never know what you're going to find out here on safari. I don't know what Andrew's doing now. Now I'm worried. A quick modification. A quick modification to what? Uh, I'm scared when you come at me with sharp objects, Andrew. Oh, oh, why, thank you. I thought he was about to give me a haircut. There we go. Let's see if I can wear my hat. Yes. Oh. Here we go. Unicorn, uh, my unicorn horn keeps my cap up, so I got a full field of vision. tracks again and this looks like the Nkabumus so I'm just trying to see where they're going I'm gonna get some of the nice lights so we can show you guys let's get all the James I think Lion tracks heading straight down the road. There I can hear Jamie coming towards us. But let me just quite try call James for a second, see where he is. James, James. I know James is in that Twin Dams area. And those line tracks heading straight towards him. And there's Jamie. Hard tracking. So there are the line tracks. So we've got Jamie on them as well. I'm pretty sure this is could be the Inkaluma ladies. Jamie's probably going to go have a little walk. Yeah. I think it's the same track side on Twin Dams. I can't take you seriously. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, had a, we had a request for a unicorn, so I made one. Ah, I see. Okay. Um, it's lovely. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I, think, I think it's time for the unicorn to come off there. <laughs> let's, let's get back to the serious business of tracking lines. I can put my hat on so I can see the sun doesn't blind me. But uh, Rachel, I hope you enjoyed your unicorn. Um, I mean, there's one track on on Twin Dams. Dams. It might be in the in the in the, the drainage line. Okay, I'll go drive. It. I'm just going to check around. Perfect. Oh. Uh, Jamie's off, giving us a hand. I'm still trying to get hold of James. Try again. James, James. The tracks head straight into here. So let's go take that little uh, two track that's got a nickname Ingwe Ali. That basically means it's Leopard Alley, although we're not looking for Leopard there, we're looking for Lion. 
Hans. James and Konzo are with the student Kuhumis. Come down, Philemon wants to cut by and head straight into the block north uh, towards that two track. I think it's possibly the same tracks I had on Twin Dams. I'm going to do Ingra Alley um, and then I'm just going to go try to check on that last track I saw on Twin Dams. I think they might have gone down into the white. Not be male lines, but lines still. Okay, copy, thanks. So what it looks like, because... Um, one second, sorry. But just uh, to the south of the pump house, they head into this little drainage system. And then I had that one, one set of tracks on uh, twin dams between Inga Alley and Walberg's Middle. Those were heading north, but then they don't continue through to Walberg's Eagle. But I lost them somewhere on the, on the road there. It was quite dark, so I'm going to have to go have another look. James is somewhere in here, so we're all in the right zone to find some lions. Scott and James have mentioned they run around quarantine for exercise and she'd like to know, is the safe with the ambush predators we have there? Uh, they run at the heat of the day when there's very little movement from said ambush predators uh, and also quarantine where the grass is short and they have a very wide field, field of view. So it is safe uh, and don't worry about them. Uh, the only thing they should be worried about is me chasing after them in a vehicle. appearing out of the, the bush there and Steph trying to run away and hide they don't think I think they're not sure if we can see them or not but uh, it's pretty hard to hide when you've got that antenna on your back so that's Brian and there's James slightly to the left and Steph is even further to the left but behind the thick bush and there's the bushwalk team so we're all in the right zone for these lions. signs for the best weather or the best time for animals. Now, Reese, it all depends. Oh, there's a big bump. So, Reese, a lot of people would say the best time to visit the Saibi Sands is in our winter months, so it's cooler because it gets exceedingly hot here during the summer. So, if you like hot weather, this is a great time of the year. Uh, if you 
not so fond of hot weather, then any time from May, June, July, August, September uh, is a bit, a bit more sort of uh, well, cold, in my opinion. But, you know, uh, and, but daytime temperatures still get to about 30 degrees Celsius, but your evenings and early mornings are very chilly. In terms of game viewing, I, my personal, and this is, I, I state this again, my personal best time of the year for game viewing in Sabi Sands is the end of October uh, into early November. It's when the bush is at its driest and there's a lot of movement of predators. Also, there's very little grass and very little water, so it makes animals a little bit easier to find and you have the best chance of seeing interactions between predator and prey. And then the other, the other best time for me would be May, uh, and that's because that's when the wild dog's dead. Andrew's just giving the lens a little sparkle, sparkle. who's 10 years old. Brooklyn says, it's snowing where I live. Does it ever snow here? It doesn't, Brooklyn, and if it did, I'd pack up my bags and leave. No, it never snows here. Sometimes we get snow on the high mountains, Drakensberg, but not here in the Sabi Sands. I don't think there's ever been snow recorded here. Actually, I know there's never been snow recorded here. But uh, uh, Brooklyn, hopefully you like snow in the cold. I don't. Uh, but got into that area where the last lion tracks were, so while I jump out of the vehicle quickly and go have a look, let's jump back on foot with James. Well everybody, this is about the closest to snow that we get out here, the most snow-coloured thing that we find, and it is hyena dung, of course. Now I'm going to inhale deeply through my nose. Mmm, the aroma is not particularly um, becoming. It, it smells, well, it smells like poo, really, because that's what it is. It is a very important territorial marker, this white dung. It's white, of course, because of the bones that the hyenas eat. It comes out green and oxidizes to white in the sun. But it plays a very important role in marking the territories of the hyena clans of various areas around here and often they will defecate together, so one will go here, one a few feet around here, and becomes a sort of midden site and marking site. This seems to be a particularly lonely piece of poo, uh, but that's okay. I don't think it mines. Then the other thing I wanted to show you here is a stunning piece of grass. Now, very few of the grasses at the moment are managing to put up these inflorescences. And I actually don't know what species this is, it's quite interesting, but what you can see are the flowers. Now, we don't tend to think of grasses as having flowers, but they do, of course. And you can see them quite nicely on this piece of grass here. The seeds will be formed within, behind the flowers, but the flowers would have been the initial start to those seeds. Now, if you're a bird, like those guinea fowl we were seeing earlier, or a dove, or a, maybe a, even a cinnamon-breasted bunting, for example, these seeds will be the ideal kind of food. And as we progress into this drought, fewer and fewer grass plants are going to have seeds like this for those birds to eat, and so they have to diversify their diets and try and eat whatever they can. Insects especially are a particularly rich source of nutrition. And I watched once a cinnamon-breasted bunting. Brian, if you zoom out a bit, I'll just show you, otherwise you're going to lose the picture. Cinnamon-breasted bunting is a tiny little thing, sort of the size of that size, the size of a sort of mm, small finch. And they jump up and they grab, they fly up, they grab the plant here and they pull it down onto the ground and then stand on it with one foot and then eat off the seeds and then let it go. And normally it pops back up again. And that's the cinnamon-breasted bunting. I'm a little bit bigger than the cinnamon-breasted bunting, not much, but a little. Right, on we go. Um, we're going to try and sort of follow up where those lion tracks went. Um, Steph thought he heard a female lion calling to the south, 
again, probably south of our boundary. So maybe the Nkuhumas have gone south, but we don't know. So let's carry on walking through here. This um, I retrieved from the bush here. I think a hyena obviously retrieved it from the workshop in some time in the distant past. It's not a f any form of weapon. It is just a form of litter collection. Right. Tally hair, Brian. On we go. Beautiful little collection of marula trees there. There does seem to be a bank of clouds coming over from the west, and that will excite Brian and I deeply, won't it, Brian? Indeed. Because obviously we have had possibly enough of the sun this year. Our eyes have been scorched. The tops of our bald heads, well, in my case and Steph's case, our bald heads have been scorched by the sun. And we're looking forward to a bit of cloud cover. Beautiful day it was yesterday. We had perfect cloud cover for most of the day, which meant that we didn't cook in our houses. Right, so this is the road where you last saw Brent, called Ingware Alley. And we're going to carry on walking along here and head down towards the Umlulwati drainage line, which is the, the major drainage line that runs through Juma over there. Now, Jennifer, you want to know, hang on one second, I'm just going to get hold of Brent. He's good. He's trying to hail me. Listen. Go. Lions are calling. A shower that's very late for them to be calling. Go ahead, Brent. James, I've you marked where the tracks cross uh, Twin Dam to go straight into the Wati. I'm going to go around the central. I didn't have any tracks on central earlier. I think they might still be lying up in the Wati. Copy that. Where are those tracks? Are they north of Ingwe Alley? So where Ingwe Alley joins the Twin Dams, probably about 60 meters to the north. Okay, copy that. Thank you. We'll move into that area now. Um, more lion audio from the south. So these lions are calling quite late into the day. Normally around now they've gone to sleep. They're not kind of uh, doing too much. But obviously there's been some kind of dispute during the night perhaps and that's why they're shouting the odds at this time of the morning. Let me put that in my pocket where it's a little bit easier to access while we're tracking. Okay, so Brent went onto the road here and as, as you heard him say, he was on the road, he circled the tracks, they've headed down towards the drainage line area where obviously he can't drive the car. And so he's gonna go around and look on the side. We'll walk into that area. Um, just remember that I think a lot of people, especially if you're perhaps new viewers, you might be worried about our safety and thinking, well, how can you be tracking the most terrifying predator in the world on foot? And the answer is because we, of course, are seen as the apex predator. So while we certainly wouldn't be doing this if there were polar bears around, which definitely see us as something to eat, lions don't see us as something to eat. They see us as a, another predator. They might see us as competition, but their general impression of us is absolute terror. Sorry, Brown fell in a hole there. Um, watch the stump there. He's trying to film and look where he's going while I am walking sideways. It's quite an impressive sight to see. And so it is perfectly safe as long as we're aware as to what's going on. Now, Jennifer, you've obviously just joined us and you want to know about the ibis that we saw earlier. It's called a Hardidar ibis, and that's an onomatopoeic name from its call, which is ah, ah, Hardidar, Hardidar. So that was the Hardidar ibis. Right, let's just hold our thumbs for some lions. Like I say, Steph thought he heard a female calling to the south, so it might be that those lions have gone into the drainage line sometime during the night last night and moved down to the south and they're calling from there. That's not, that would certainly be their territorial boundary between them and the Styx Pride, so it's, not, it's quite possible that they're asserting themselves. They'll be happy to call now. The Birmingham boys have stopped killing them, have stopped kind of harassing them. And that means that they can now call without fear possibly, or certainly with less fear, that they're, that they're going to be attacked by the resident males of the area, which of course for a long time is what happened as the territorial takeover between the Matimbas and the Birmingham boys happened. 
So I think you'll find that they're probably now starting to reassert themselves. They've certainly been mating with the Birmingham boys quite a lot. And so I think that they are now happy to reassert their territories and they're definitely on the boundary between whatever lions those are calling is, are on the boundary between the sticks and the Inkahumas. And for those of you who are new viewers, while I'm strolling along here, we're walking quite quickly to try and get to the road where the tracks last were. Um, the two prides that we see most often here, sorry Brian, are the Styx pride, or that not we haven't seen them for a while, but they're the kind of, those are the one group of females that we see and then the Inkahumas who we provide the bulk of our lion viewing. And the sticks at the moment, I think it's just three lionesses if I'm not mistaken, but I haven't seen them for so long that I couldn't po properly, properly tell you. Sorry, four lionesses. Um, right, Eric, in Virginia Beach, you want to know about marula season. Well, this is a marula tree, in case you didn't know. And marula season is now, Eric, and there are very, very few marulas around. And that's purely a function of the water. Uh, Steph was out on, in the communities a little bit earlier this week, on the, during the weekend, and he said that there were lots of marulas in some of those areas. So where there has been isolated rain, the marula trees have produced fruit, but out here it's been a very lean season. Around about now we would be picking up, normally we'd be picking up marulas and eating them at will on our walks, but at the moment I've seen very few. There were some in December which I thought was very early, and but after that that's done so i'm just going to get an update from brent he gave an update there sorry brent confirm you do have tracks there i'm uh, not sure i'm not i just wanted to make sure they didn't head north up from wadi but they've gone i think i have i haven't got the tracks so we have marked them on the road's last track so you're hearing brent now Okay, copy, thanks. So with any luck, they're in the drainage line. He's checked, he's checked round onto Central Road, which is just the other side of the drainage here. Now we're approaching the drainage here. And so what we'll do is try and find these tracks and then head into the drainage line and see if they aren't lying there quietly, which would be very, very nice indeed. While we're doing that, I'll send you back across to Brent he can give you his own update and we'll see you hopefully with some good news. So James and I are in this area and we're really confident that these lines aren't too far off. So I know James has just crossed the road heading towards the Mawati riverbed. I just had a quick look over there to make sure they hadn't gone north up the riverbed. Oh, speak of the devil. And uh, just going to have a quick, quick word. Always better in person than over the radio. Good morrow, good sirs. Look, there's Steph trying to hide. He's not that good at it. You can see him behind the, <laughs> the, the bush there. Ambushed. Yeah, I, yes, I ambushed too. And good morning, good morning. Hello. 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 Um, literally just past the, with it on the right hand side, the Herensis. They go straight down. I've checked, I walked into the drainage line above. They're not going north, so I think maybe towards there. So I think they're, they're close, hopefully. Very exciting. It's good luck. I hope you find Thank them on, on, the, on the footy. More lions calling there, and Steph thought maybe females as well, so. Yeah. Uh, we, Jamie checked, and we checked Drakensberg. Jamie checked Twin Dams. All the calling mm. is south of us. East. It's so both. Just, yeah, but there's it's some both, yeah. Um, They're on a net. There's th three of them there with sticks, okay. according to ah, Craig. Okay. Ah. That's interesting. Right. Anyway, as you were. Good as luck. You, no messing around this morning. See? Good. <laughs> Off you go now. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Actually, wait, James, before we go. Um, for Rachel, I think we should have not one but two unicorns. Come here, James. Unicorns. So we had a special request for a unicorn this morning. So there we go. Oh, uh, no, 
now. You just stick it on your head like that, and okay. then you become a unicorn. Okay. And there we go. All Mythical right. beasts and all. I'll put no, no, there. no. On your fore it has Indeed. to be on your forehead. It is on my forehead. No, because that is attached to cloth. That's not attached to skin. So you're, no, you're, you're, you're just a pretend Goodbye, unicorn. Goodbye, everybody, again. Okay. <laughs> uh, just, sorry, sorry, Rachel. That's, a, that's what you call a fake unicorn. And there's someone pretending to be a unicorn, not an actual unicorn. So we're very confident on a more serious note. The lines are not too far away. And the tracks have gone straight down to this little river system. And they definitely haven't gone north. And they haven't gone south because they've crossed the Moati to the south. And there are those lions who are calling to the south of us. And what a wonder. The Nkuma is thinking about making an incursion into Sticks country. That boundary between them is quite, quite porous. And we do find both of those prides utilizing this southeastern area of Juma. And it's going to be interesting to see when Miss Amber Eyes decides to stop mating and join up with her pride again. check this area again here. Uh, quite often in the early morning lions will like to lie up on open sandy patches like that down there. So we're just checking on the edge of the drainage system. Uh, hopefully it shouldn't be too long till we have some kitty cats. would like to know a little bit of guide slang. A few days ago we did discuss khaki fever. And uh, Meredith would like to know a few little other little guide slangs. Well Meredith and I don't Meredith, I don't know if I can. What if you come on safari and you know all the guides tricks? Uh, all the little sneaky sneaky things and shangan words that the guides use to talk about or hide things from their guests. Uh, let me think of a good one. Andrew, can you think of any off the top of your head? Ah, a shikankanka, which a lot of you will know is a cheetah. It's also a guide slang for a pretty girl. So if a guide has a pretty girl on his game drive vehicle, he will say he has a shikankanka on the back of his vehicle. Another one of those depending where you are, if you're outside in the Shanghai part of the world. Uh, there's a very beautiful butterfly called a Foxy Shiraxis. So quite often in other parts of Africa, if they have a pretty girl in the back of their vehicle, it will be said that uh, there's a Foxy Shiraxis fluttering about.
she wasn't laughing at me ridiculously this time, now that I no longer am a unicorn. been a unicorn this morning and bear in Ontario, Canada wants to know if I can be an art fog. Well, I think if anyone around can be an art fog, that would be Andrew Joseph Francis, uh, since one of his nicknames is many, is the art fog. Now, Andrew, uh, can we get you to do an art fog impression for the camera? Only at night time. <laughs> Only at night time. Uh, and Andrew is correct, art, art fox are nocturnal. So, unfortunately, we'll have to wait for the sunset safari. Keep your eye on the Juma cam, <laughs> okay, there we go. Keep your eye on the Juma cam after dark. Okay, so if those lion tracks pop out, they're going to pop out on this road. I've already checked Central Road, and there's no tracks coming through that side. Well, there weren't when we passed through earlier. We're just going to go quite slowly along here, make sure we don't miss anything. And if we had to take, if those lines walked in a straight line, I'm going to guess that from this corner to the big torchwood tree on this road is where those tracks should come out, unless they are still sleeping in this block here. is wondering, will the presence of lions stop the guides checking on Karula's den size? Oh, there's Ooh, some vultures up ahead. Now, whether they are there because of lions or it's just a convenient spot to have a snooze, I'm going to go with more than likely, even if the lions are there, it's a convenient spot for a snooze. And I think they probably rested there last night as it is too early for them to really have got moving yet. The thermals aren't out. Of course, unless they were really close in the area when the lions made a kill this morning and, and were able to jump across, but I think probably more coincidence than cause. But uh, Tammy, uh, the lion truck's actually heading away from Karula's den site, and uh, we will get together with Taxon and discuss it before we do anything further. but not necessarily, and also it will not be checked during the early morning or late afternoon when the other predators are out and about, it will be checked in the heat of the day, where it's very unlikely that anything else will be moving. Let's just stop and listen for a second. You never know, maybe the vultures know something we don't. What we're listening for is the growl of lions on a kill. As I said, I think it's more coincidental that the vultures are in the same area as the lion tracks than anything else. Only hornbills, rattling cesticulars. And a white rod scrub robin. And no tracks just yet. I keep checking. This is the large torchwood that I was talking about over here. And I think it's probably directly opposite in a straight line where those line tracks went into that drainage system. You've got your spotting eyes on. There's a giraffe track. And that's about it.
tracking big cats is definitely one of our favorite things to do out here in the bush. And we must remember, it's not always about the big cats, but they are so amazing to see. And being out in the fresh early morning is a privilege for us. I love the early mornings. Probably my favorite time of the day to be out in the bush. On there. Just a funny. No, two hornbills. Ah, it's two hornbills just together. They look like some something a bit different. There you go, two hornbills. No lions under the tree. Yet? Oh dear. Lions. <laughs> Pretty much where we predicted if they'd carried on walking, they'd pop out. Yeah, the Inkabumas. Hello, ladies. Did you catch something? It doesn't look like if we're getting sniffed at the moment. Morning, morning. We just I feel a bit bad. James is on tracking them on foot. And, and, and we have found them on next to the road. Uh, James, they're on Vulture's Nest, probably about 100 meters to the north of the large torchwood. Stations in Kuma Pride on Vulture's Nest Road, 100 meters to the north of the large torchwood tree. So it doesn't look like they've eaten, but look at that glorious light on her. Look at those eyes glinting in the morning light. Copy. I only see three. Can, am I allowed to smack you on the back of the head, Andrew? Please, sir. So Andrew says he can only see three. And if we go slightly to the left, Andrew, you see the termite mound? Zoom in on the termite mound, that little termite mound, and look behind it. Uh -huh. There's number four. So I'm just going to pop around so we can get a slightly better view. doesn't look to have joined again yet. Lady's got quite a peculiar look on her face today. And they were quite jumpy yesterday. Uh, and the reason for that was the Sabi Sands were flying uh, anti-poaching choppers and it did disturb them a little bit. So they are still a little bit jumpy. Sorry, ladies. And uh, Jamie told me quite a funny story when she got back from drive, that the flatulence of one of them sent them all disappearing. OK, there we go. She's coming closer to the vehicle again. She's relaxed. And you can see they definitely haven't eaten a slight stiff right leg as well, right back leg. She's probably going to go lie down in this heavy shade 
just to the right of us. He's actually moving right around back towards the vehicle. And as I was mentioning a little bit earlier, lions do like to lie out in the open in the cool morning, soaking up that early morning rays. But they're definitely not as fat as they were yesterday. I don't think they've managed to catch anything overnight. Next one off to the shade. It's a sub adult. He's not nearly a big girl. Oh, and next one. So it looks like they're going to head off into the shade now. They are beautiful creatures. You can almost, you can see the muscles rippling as they walk and all that latent energy. Oh, here comes the female with that slightly more pronounced lip. And it's not uncommon uh, for lions to be limpy or stiff, especially now they've probably been sleeping for a while. And the more she moves, that'll probably loosen up and catching things like buffalo and giraffe, even a kudu, a kick can produce quite a, a bruise or a damage. So they've moved into the shade. the green shrub that the lions were lying next to. Um, I'm sure he's referring to the weeping wattle, the spike thorn, uh, or the pushed down buffalo thorn. That's the three that they were lying next to earlier. There we go. Moved not far at all, but into the shade as the morning is heating up. like the lions are going to do what lions do best and that is sleep oh bit of a phlegm and grimace there smelling urine so what is happening there is that the urine has been taken across uh, an organ in the top of the lion's mouth called a jacobson's organ and it passes over a whole bunch of chemical information uh, to do with estrus cycles and health and things. Of course, we, we can't understand all of it. And uh, human beings actually had a Jacobson's organ and it's a remnant now, that sort of little hole on the top of your mouth. But because we developed verbal communication, we, that Jacobson's organ has become redundant in human beings. Almost looks like her head is about to pop down. She's really fighting to keep it up. And you can see the slow slide to sleep. Oh, there we go. And it's so wonderful to have these Inkahuma girls back, and they have been around quite a bit over the last week or two. So, great for us. Adults and doing a bit of grooming. I'm just remo and removing my jersey, and like the lions, I can't move into the shade. I 
Yeah, she's very... Oh, look at that. She, she's that female with a scar. That stretching that's going on there. So she has a very distinct scar on her hindquarters, and I'm not sure how she got it. Could have been from feeding, fighting with other lions. Could have been an injury from... Oh, there we go. Flop again. Hopefully the helicopters are not too busy today. This young sub-adult over here is growing into such a beautiful lioness. It's amazing to think that not that long ago, they were, she was so noticeably smaller than the rest of the pride. Now she's nearly the same size. There were two of them. We're not sure exactly what happened to the other, but it was at that time when the Birminghams were creating havoc and killing lionesses and chasing everyone about. The fact that lions are very fastidious groovers, they look beautifully clean, they are not. Look at that, look how beautiful her eyes are. See, she's got a few scars, but while these lions are flat, let's go see what James is up to on foot. <clears throat> well, everybody, we don't have any lions. We were on the tracks. We found the tracks coming down through here towards, obviously, where Brent is because we were following the tracks to where Brent is. And I'm really quite disappointed that we didn't get to see them on foot. It would have been so lovely. Anyway, You've got them with the vehicle, you can get much closer in the vehicle. It would have been a brief view with us on foot anyway, we would have seen them. Um, it depends if they would have seen us or not. You know, they're so wily that I think they probably would have seen us. And in a group like that, they'd have sat up and looked. And then probably if we'd backed off, they'd laid them down. So it would have been a very brief view, but it's just so exciting to see lions on foot. Anyway, we've stopped here and we're going to show you something I think fascinating. It's not quite as exciting as lions, but it's certainly as fascinating, especially as fascinating as lions that are sleeping on their backs. This tree, Gymnosporia buxifolia, say that a few times after you've had a couple of G&Ts of a summer's afternoon, Gymnosporia buxifolia, I think it's the most wonderful name for a tree, is covered in lichen. And I think there are more than two or three species of lichen on this tree. We don't really know too much about lichens, but for the fact that they are a kingdom of organism entirely on their own. So for many of you without any kind of biological training, you will think that there are only two kingdoms in the world of life, the plants and the animals. And that is not in fact true. The, uh, there are various, the, I think there, at the last count there were five, and they would consist of the plants, the animals, the protists, the bacteria, and something, uh, the fungi, of course, they're a different kingdom. And these guys fit somewhere in between, as far as I understand it. They are a symbiosis between fungi and algae. And it's a little bit like how our cells evolved. There are two separate organisms that have decided to cooperate with each other, and now they've become so interlinked that they can't live without each other. The fungus gets into the rootstock of the tree, or not the rootstock, the vascular tissue of the tree, and kind of takes bits of nutrients off the tree. I don't think it harms the tree at all, so it's kind of an epiphytic relationship. And then the algae is the green tinge that you can see on the lichen, and the algae performs the function of photosynthesis, so it helps to sort of produce its own carbohydrates and other nutrients, whereas the fungus, of course, oh, I think the fungus also digests some of the outer parts of the tree bark. Isn't that amazing? And they can't live without each other now. 
Now when I say that they evolved in a similar way to a human human cell, what happened, oh well, in fact, hang on a second, before I do that, it's quite a long story I want to tell you. Let's go back to the lions. There's high action there. They're grooming each other. So, a wonderful bit of aloe grooming, social grooming going on here. So that beautiful young lioness, the sub-adult, is grooming one of the adults. And there we go, you see that very distinct sort of and that's biting and removing ticks or fleas. So quite often after a bout of grooming, you can actually see little spots of blood from where the ticks have been popped. Oh, she got one. Oh, she get one. Oh, it doesn't look too impressed with the taste of that. <laughs> oh, there we go. Now, finished with the grooming. So, the one lioness is off entertaining the Birmingham boys, and Judy in San Francisco is wondering what the greeting will be like when they return. Will it be like the hyenas, loud and noisy and jubilant, or will it be more subdued? I think it will be, in terms of sound, much, much more subdued, but I think it will be quite an impressive greeting. Lots of licking, probably playing, jumping, and lots of aloe grooming. But hopefully we are there to record that. And now after that huge hustle and bustle of movement, back to Lion's favorite pastime, snoozing. Nothing quite looks as comfortable as a lion having a schnooze. So Sunshine Lee on YouTube is wondering how big is a lion's tongue? Well, Sunshine, I think... You're going to have to ask the lion yourself. Just take your hand, pop it in its mouth, and measure it for me, and let me know. No, I'm only joking. Um, a lion's tongue is probably around uh, 10 to 15 centimeters, depending on the size of the lion. So I'm trying to think. Maybe we should meander on, see if we can find some elephants, and then come back here a little bit later. Why don't you guys let me know what you would like to do? Would you like to sit with the sleepy kitties for a bit longer, or would you like to go look for something else and then come back? Pop us an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter to quote the clash. Should we stay or should we go? So Don is asking about the spots on a lion's legs and belly. Uh, that look sort of like leopard rosettes and she'd like to know what that means. So those are remnant spots from when they're cubs. So the big cats, both lion and leopard, will leave their cubs unattended. So when a lioness first gives birth to cubs, she'll keep it away from the more boisterous uh, members of the pride for up to a month sometimes. And the cubs will not join the pride. They will be kept in a separate den. And they are very spotty when they're little, and that's to help with camouflage, so they're not discovered by other lions or hyenas or leopard. So those are remnant cub spots uh, that they needed when they were very young to help with camouflage. And it definitely feels like someone's just turned on the thermostat. The temperature is rising. 
very quickly, I guess, when we started at 76, around 19 degrees Celsius this morning, I would guess it's probably close on 28 degrees, even maybe even 30 degrees already. So, it is, according to final control, 26.78. I'm not so sure. I think it's warmer than that. What do you think, Andrew? When the sun's out, yes. Yes. For sure. And the maximum temperature for the day is supposed to be 39 degrees Celsius. Andrew doesn't look very happy with that temperature. <laughs> And 30, 39 is close on 100 Fahrenheit. So Mike on YouTube says we can leave uh, if we find Bangalore. Uh, Mike, I think uh, that the chances of that are quite unlikely, but we'll go give it a try. So we're going to leave these lines. We will pop back through a little bit later on the drive, make sure they're still here. I'm supremely confident they probably would not have moved an inch, maybe rolled over, and that's about it. So let's go see what James is up to while we go try and find a pangolin for Mike. So we've come to try and find some water here in this dry and dusty pan, which is now dry and dusty, of course. And this is called chela pan, and a chela is a frog in Shangan. There are no frogs in here. I downloaded a special frog app for my telephone this year, especially so that I could learn more about the frogs of the area, but that's just not going to happen this year, I'm afraid. The froggies are not going to do too much in the way of breeding. Right, now, the story I wanted to tell you dovetails quite nicely with this, ooh, that was very painful, Brian. I think I cracked a nail. Ah, <laughs> thank you. Right. <laughs> thank you, Siberia Zumi. You want to know if unicorns eat lichens? They do not eat lichens, no. No, we eat squirrels, small children, and nuts. That's the sort of thing that uh, unicorns eat, Siberia. Now, this area here, of course, is a mud wallow and I wanted to tell you a little bit a little story about evolution and how cells started to form and this pan is a nice sort of starting point because we think it happened in, with a sort of primordial soup if you like I think Richard Dawkins called it a primordial soup which would have been a kind of nutrient rich area a bit like this or nutrient rich in that it had a lot of carbon and that sort of thing in it and eventually little organic molecules under the action possibly of lightning now this is in the sort of pre aerobic earth so there was no oxygen at the time and lightning you can imagine striking a very I think sulfur rich atmosphere striking on a pan like this full of nutrients of different kinds of undifferentiated or differentiated molecules. Now suddenly what they would do is they would have joined up together and then eventually that process would have happened again and again and again until you had two things that did different things, that performed different functions. So you would have had something like a, uh, an early mitochondria which would have found a way to produce energy through using oxygen. And then you would have found something like a, uh, what else have we got in, inside a cell, like a sort of primitive chloroplast, if you like, that could produce energy from the sun. And they would have sort of lived together and eventually a, a membrane would have formed around them until they became one. Now that's a little bit like that lichen, where the algae and the fungi have become one organism. And it's exactly the same as happened when during the very, very early evolution of life, where little molecules and little things, that you couldn't even call them organisms yet, became intertwined with each other for their mutual benefit. And that's how cells started. And eventually, of course, those cells evolved into large things like 
us, Brian, mm. and unicorns, of course. Now, it is very dry out here. I can smell water buck. We've been smelling giraffe. We've been seeing a bit of buffalo dung, but nothing in the way of mammals so far. But we continue along our way, and it's just the most pleasant morning. It's lovely cloud cover. It hasn't got too hot yet, and it's just wonderful being on foot. I find it so exhilarating, just feeling crunch. Here we go. Here we go. Just feeling the crunch of the dirt under my feet and the crunch of the dry grass is also wonderful. Here are some harvested termites. Now, they're out quite late, interestingly, and here's one here that is harvesting that piece of grass. And you'll probably find that their nest, if I haven't lain upon it, is not too far from here. The entrance will be not too far. That harvester decided that he's not harvesting that particular piece. Let's follow him and see where he goes. Here might be an entrance. Look, there he goes. So I'm sitting on the burrow of the harvested termites. Here they have taken advantage of where a buffalo, uh, well, went to the loo basically, or probably an elephant actually. They've taken the elephant dung apart completely, dragged it down underneath the ground. Now can you imagine how important that must be? Brian, if you look right next to your left foot, don't move your left foot. Look at all of those harvesters there. Young harvester termites taking advantage of buffalo dung there. You can imagine how crucially important the role that these harvester termites are playing is to the fertilization of the earth out here. They are dragging the dung into the ground where it will inevitably mix with the soil and the soil when the grass seeds eventually come to it will thrive. Now can you imagine if all the termites were dead? None of that fertilization would happen. The landscape would ch change so profoundly that I don't believe we'd be even able to imagine what it would be without the combined mass and work of these tireless termites. So while I know in North America they do uh, cause a lot of problems for your homes, out here they're a totally crucial part of what we do. Brian, here's one that's bringing something back to the nest. An enormous piece of grass. I think he's going to take it straight into this tunnel. Can you see him here? How he's navigating with that giant, basically that's like you and me carrying a pine tree, a huge pine tree. Now, he'll reverse in. No, oh, you've missed it. And often what they do is they'll come and dump the things at the side here and then go back down and others will come and take them out. Shall we help him? I know we shouldn't really help him, but I'm going to. There you are. <laughs> now he's just cross. And those termites, the ones with the black on them, you can see um, will knock about round about this time of the day. They will go into the nest again soon. But the others, the ones that Brian was just showing you, I think if actually I'm looking at it, I think they've been exposed. As he walked along here, it may have been me, I think this was kicked off them. And they are, oh look, there we go. So I'm going to cover them up again. They are not very good in the sun. They have no pigmentation on them, which means they will burn like vampires in the sun and you'll find that they will, as it gets hotter, they will go down into the ground and rest for much of the day. Oh, there's one other fascinating thing here, Brian, I don't know if we're going to be able to get this. There's an ant. There's an ant that has raided this termite mound nest. It's got a baby termite mound in its jaws. Termite in its jaws. See that? It's moving very fast. You got it, Brian? Yep. Should I try and pick it up? No, no. You got it. See that? That little ant, that beastly, beastly ant has raided, it somehow snuck into the termite burrow, taken away that little baby termite, and is now going to go and devour him somewhere, probably in his own nest. I find that utterly fascinating. Nasty, nasty anty. Mm. Right, that was a good little stop. Let's carry on. <laughs> this 
is wonderful. Hello, Christopher. You're in Arizona and you say being on the bushwalk has inspired you to go out into the bush, into the wilderness, into the desert with a couple of friends. You're hoping to see some bobcats, I think some wild horses and various other animals out there. I think that's just wonderful and I'm so glad that our little walks here have inspired you to go and look for those sorts of things out in nature. I have no doubt that you're going to have a wonderful experience. Let's, let's stay away from the road. Let's head along this way. The last time I saw Mvula, he was walking down this little pathway here. Magnificent old male leopard that he is. The heat is starting to build slightly, but it's certainly not uh, desperately hot by any stretch of the imagination. Just look at this, just look at this Zizifus though, and how the leaves are wilting. Now Annie, you're in Durban on YouTube and you want us to try and show you a milkweed Milkweed, I think we're going to only find if there's a bit more water. I haven't seen, I've seen one milkweed plant here, so I don't think there are a lot of them. They're those kind of, you find them all over the world. They look like weeds, I suppose they are, and they've got those kind of um, spiky baubles on them, and they've got a very milky latex, which is highly toxic in them. And that's what, of course, the larvae of the monarch butterfly and various other animals uh, will eat in order to become poisonous to potential predators. So we're heading towards Twin Dams now, where Steph has promised to show me the nest of a trap, door, trap jaw ant. Now, if you don't know what a trap jaw ant is, it's an ant with a very nasty set of jaws on it, and they're so powerful that the ant is able to use them to sort of jump and escape situations. So if it's caught by something like an antlion, for example, it flicks those jaws and it goes pew, sort of, um, it would be the equivalent of you and I jumping 20 feet into the air, which I'm unable to do. Some alarm calling. A bit of alarm calling bird around here. Some battises. We'll just keep looking. Long billed crombex. Let's walk slowly through here. Pretty little angel. That's a Twitter handle, I'm not referring to Brian. <laughs> Pretty little angel. You want to know about snakes and whether we see them. I haven't seen many this year, but. I know Jamie's seen quite a few, Scott's seen a couple, Brent's seen a few, so they are around. But you know, they do move away from us. They will feel the footfalls of, as we walk along, they can feel the vibrations. They don't want anything to do with us and they will move away. And it is only when you disturb a snake and corner it that it becomes dangerous. And so. Generally, we are unaffected by snakes. We did find, I told a story the other day, I was having my morning constitutionals in the bathroom. I wasn't actually driving that morning. And uh, Mama Z or Zordwe was busy with the washing machine next door. And she started howling in a manner that made me think she'd been set upon by a pack of rabid leopard. So I leapt out of the bathroom, dressed in nothing but my towel. And she came herring out of the other bathroom, panting and holding on to her chest. And Mama Z, I said, what has happened? And she said, Nyoka, 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 which means snake, snake, snake. So I immediately retrieved some kind of a stick. Scott came over. We didn't want to go in there without eye protection in case it was a spitting cobra. And 
the Yorker turned out to be a brown house snake that long. Uh, but you could never take a chance with a snake. Scott eventually caught it with his hands. What a lovely morning this is. And here some virtual starlings going. I have to do all the calls, of course, because you can't hear them. You can't hear too much ambient noise in these microphones. Now, there was also a barn swallow, and I don't think they're going to be long for this area either, given the dearth of insects. They will be going back to Europe when the time comes. I suspect only around sort of the end of March, possibly even April. Ooh, the birds keep flying away. Christopher, you want to know what some of the weirdest bugs in Africa are. Um, there are lots of different kinds of very strange bugs that we get here. Um, bug, of course, as I've said before, is a, is a biological term. I'm assuming you're just meaning creepy crawly. Bug is a, a specific order of insects. I'm assuming you're meaning the entire sort of ambit of invertebrate life. Um, I think one of the most intimidating looking things, but completely harmless, would be something called a whip scorpion. A whip scorpion looks, uh, it's got these long tentacles and it's got obviously eight legs and they look like they would swallow your head whole if you were to touch them, even though they only get to about that size. But they look frightening, utterly harmless things, but I've seen many people leap up and down with terror at the sight of a whip scorpion when they come out from behind your mirror as uh, perhaps you are brushing your hair if you happen to have some. So I think that's probably the, the most odd looking, most odd looking thing here. And Jerry says she's just Googled a picture and they do look terrifying. Now, I was hoping to show you some tracks here, but they seem to have disappeared. We are on the road because I want to try and make some, make a bit of progress towards Twin Dams and see if we can't find something there. This also, of course, affords Brian the ability to walk backwards without fear of walking into anything. And, um, of course, unless there's a buffalo standing behind him. But he's counting on me to warn him should a buffalo uh, be found just behind us. All right, I think while we are, while we are walking to Twin Dams at quite a speed, let's go across to Brent Leo Smith. I'm not sure what he's up to. I'm sure he's looking for something. That is what he does, of course, and does it very well. Let's head across to him, and I'll see you at Twin Dams. As the mercury rises in the thermometer, I decided let's head off towards Sydney's waterhole. We've been having some really lovely elephant sightings in that area, and I'm hoping it has it gets a little bit warmer. They might be heading there for a drink. Andrew was noting how pretty the clouds were, and you can just see how those are little cumuluses that might build during the day. zebras an introverted animal where are they hiding well they're not uh, Nick, we haven't really been cruising the zebra areas there's a good chance we're actually going to see some on one of these crests as we move towards the waterhole and uh, hopefully we will find oh and for the bird is out there a nice big raptor to go with the white black vultures from earlier and i'm going to let you guys id this one because i know what it is already so who can identify that lovely big raptor sitting atop the dead tree? Remember to look for general size, shape, and impression. If you know what bird that is, pop your answers 
Oh, perfect. Look at that. Beautiful. Pop your answers on an email to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag SafariLive on Twitter. bird test for our birders out there. And, uh, once you get used to birding, and I'm sure quite a few of our viewers are at that stage now, as soon as you just see a bird, uh, that general size, shape and impression, without even seeing the distinguishing features, you're going to be able to identify it. nice for us. I mean, the flies last year were particularly bad. And quite a lot of them are, are, are not only house flies and blow flies, but a, a really evil little creature called a stable fly. And a uh, stable fly obviously spends a lot of time around horses and stuff with their livestock. And uh, anyone who lives in, in South Africa, uh, especially in the warmer areas, well, their dogs and, and cats are incredibly badly bitten on their ears. And that's why the stable fly and, there's no dogs, cats, or lions to bite. And if they bite, what, uh, Safari Live cameraman presenters. chatting about mosquitoes and I unfortunately is a, out of all the insects it's something I know far too much about. They literally adore me uh, and I get eaten alive and Susie's wondering is why are there more, why are there more mosquitoes uh, in camp than in the bush? Well Susie there's more nice little damp corners for them to hide in. There's also often uh, stagnant water around uh, human habitation, ponds, buckets of water even they can breed in. And obviously, one of their favorite host species, uh, human beings. Now, one of the big problems with mosquitoes, obviously, uh, although this area is a very low risk malaria area, it is nevertheless a malaria area, is of course the different diseases they're vectors for. And uh, as a 
goes with malaria. I am a, a one, what, what, what one could, could probably call an expert. Um, out of the five or six different strains, I've had four. And I've had malaria almost as many times as I am old, as years as, as, years I am old. I'm waiting for my big 3-0 for malaria. Uh, touch wood, if it doesn't come. It's not, it's not an anniversary I want to, uh, want to celebrate. Have you had malaria, Andrew? Negative. Negative. Too strong for malaria. Too strong for malaria, yes. I, uh, but malaria, as to quote my dad, is full of wonderful little quotes. Malaria is not serious if you take it seriously. So these days, as soon as I get malaria, I don't even need to go to the doctor. Um, I know the symptoms so well uh, that I will treat myself. And in my pelican case here, I carry two courses of malaria meds just in case. You never know when you need them. And you could be in an area, like if I was traveling around the States, where a doctor doesn't know much about malaria. So uh, the only time I was seriously in hospital from it was by a misdiagnosis, a misdiagnosis by someone. So now I carry the meds with me. But while we have a look, we're just about to pop around the corner and see if there are any elephants at Sydney's waterhole. If none, uh, we're going to jump back on with Commander Bond. Right, everybody. We were walking towards the nest and we stopped in our tracks as we beheld this great creature, the trap jaw ant. Now, I'm not sure if you can see, but this ant has got a formidable pair of jaws. And apparently second in mechanical speed only to the mantis shrimp. That is the speed with which those jaws close. Have you got him there, Brian? How's that? Mm -hmm. You can see the jaws opening and closing. And those, they're phenomenal. So what he does is this trap jaw ant, like I was saying, obviously, you, I'm sure most of you know what an ant line is. They make these little conical pits into which an ant like this might fall. And then the ant lion comes out and grabs them and eats them. Now, apparently these jaws are designed such that should he fall into an ant lion's trap, were he to open the jaws very quickly, which is what he's able to do far more quickly than any other organism on earth, except the mantis shrimp, they would shoot him out of the ant lion pit and into safety, or perhaps into the jaws of a waiting bird, in which case he'll be eaten anyway. So isn't that magnificent? I'm really, really pleased that we found this trap jaw ant. Right, from this tiny little ant, vicious creature, let's go and find some thirsty, long-nosed pachyderms with Brent. So, it seems like my elephant behavior reading is spot on. I said, as it gets warmer, I was hoping to find a herd of elephants at the waterhole. And there we go. Now, a waterhole like this will actually get herds throughout the day. And I think we have timed our arrival spectacularly well, because it looks like it could be another herd about to... Oh, no, it's a big herd of buffalo. See them, Andrew? Yeah. Yeah, so there's a big herd of buffalo also coming to drink. So we have timed our arrival spectacularly well. I thought they might, I just saw movement behind there. I thought there might be more ellies, but it's a, a big breeding herd of buffalo. Watch out, guys. There's some lion ladies down the road. You can actually see the dust coming off out of the bush behind them. And let's look at the ellies while they're drinking, and the buff will, I'm sure, come through shortly. You just let the guys know. Shambio and Love and Shambio Nyari, Sydney's Marty. Copy Andrew, yeah. 
Yeah, we are about to come down and drink. There we go, isn't that wonderful? Lovely herd of Ellie's. It, it could possibly be the same herd from yesterday. I don't think so, though. Um, there are a lot of elephants around at the moment. And there we go. Here come the buffalo marching towards the waterhole. And if there's a boisterous young elephant bull or two, they might give the buffalo a chasing and actually see the dust rising out of the bush as they come through and at this t when it's very dry you can actually track buffalo herds by their dust and also it's always a good spot to look for lions so lions will often trail these big herds it's going to be interesting to see how many should we have a, have a guess before they all appear? I say at least 200. What do you think, Andrew? 250. 250. Okay, Andrew, I now want you to count each individual buffalo, if you want to be specific like that. One elephant's being naughty. Yes, there we go. As I said, we might get some Eddie buff interaction. Hope you guys, if you're hearing that snap snap, it's just me snap snapping a few photographs. And I suggest you do the same. Snap a few screenshots, share them with us on our Facebook page or on Twitter using the hashtag Safari Live. And our Facebook page is Safari Live. Look at those buffalo pouring in for a drink. These big herds have to cover big distance in this very dry climate. Uh, look at that. There's a standoff. <laughs> that buffalo is going in between the elephants for a drink. He's a big buffalo bull, and he's not scared of anything. <laughs> and he's the only buffalo who's decided to drink there. And there's literally just a stream of them continuing to come. I can still see more coming through the trees. <laughs> there's a serious uh, The elephant's unimpressed that the buffalo was not scared of him. And he might try to rectify that young Ellie bull. So not as big a herd as I think Andrew and I both both thought. There's only about a hundred, and unless there's some more on their way. No, there's just a big Ellie bull coming now. Looks like a nice big bull off to the back behind that marula tree. Or is it just a big cow? No, it's a nice big bull. So not the biggest herd of buffalo, but here comes a big early bull to join the fray. And these water holes are so important at the moment. Oh, look at that tiny little Ellie with up at the front there. There's a couple of small ellies, but that one up ahead is baby, baby. It's a couple of weeks old at the, at the, at the most, but we, hopefully they come towards us and we can have a closer look. Oh, that is a big boy coming. Not the oldest but he's on his way as well you just see him marching through the bush there now 
I almost half expect some marauding lions to appear over that damn wall now and create a bit of pandemonium. And well spotted by Liss on Twitter, literally where that lone buffalo is right in front there is some egyptian geese and some goslings let's looking after the bird is out there oh and there's a hornbill just flew across the frame oh it's fighting with a almost looked like it was having an argument with a fork-tailed drongo there There the eddies there. Oh, looks like they might head up into that little. Oh, look at the big guy. He's got the water walk. I love it. And their head starts flapping as they head towards the water, getting excited for a drink. Uh, young bull. Quite big, but I think he might chase the buffalo for good measure, just because he can. There we go, just like that. <laughs> oh, look at that. Isn't that amazing? Just showing the buffalo who's boss. Going to greet the other elephants now. Oh, it looks like the Ellies might come right towards us as well. And the buffalo, too. So this could be amazing if we just sit here. We might be engulfed by two of Africa's big five. Oh, there's someone else off to chase buffalo. Ears are out. There we go, trumpet. Run, buffalo, run. you are planning on visiting Kruger in the next little while I know some of our viewers do get there occasionally I would severely rec I would s s severely not severely sincerely recommend uh, that after it gets a bit hot go find one of the prominent permanent water holes and sit and the animals will come to you So Joel in Oregon is wondering what water hole this is. And there's some Sabi Sands guys hard at work fixing the pump. And you can see how the buffalo and elephant have taken almost no notice of them. So Joel is wondering which water hole this is. This is Sydney's water hole. It's just across our northern boundary in Buffalo's Hook. But fortunately, we've got a nice view of it from here. And it is quite nice to sit a little bit further from the animals occasionally. And so you can actually really see the sort of the landscape and the atmosphere. There we go, and you can see that's the Manuleti Game Reserve in the back there. And this is the closest water for a really long, long way in all this direction here. So it is a very busy, busy spot. And the Ellies look like they might come surround us might pop out just behind us, so we're just going to wait here a little bit to see where they pop out. The buffalo seem to just be mulling about. There's one or two playing in the mud. But if they head on to Juma, I think it's quite likely that those Inkahoma ladies will hear them. A herd of buffalo makes quite a lot of noise, all the lowing and movement. Oh, bless you, Andrew. And uh, that's literally, if you had to put into human terms, the sound of a breeding herd of buffalo to lions is the same as a small child to the ice cream truck driving past. The hornbills caught something. There. Uh, he's, no, look at that, it's amazing. He's just flipped an old buffalo pad and he's eating the termites from underneath it.
and Andrew has come to join us. I told him about the buffalo and the elephants, and he's making his way here. No problem, then Jova and the Gwari's here, and then are there. Thank you very much. There you go. There goes Andrew. And it looks like the buffalo might actually cross into Juma. Oh, there's still an elephant. Are we going to have another scene? Hope you guys are getting some fantastic screenshots of the buffalo and elephant together. Buffalo have arrived, but still not quite the large herd Andrew and I were predicting. Looks like that Ellie's almost herding buffalo. There we go. And we'll ask about zebras. I can actually hear them calling. Not too far off. So Siberia, one of our zoomies, is wondering what is the largest gathering of elephants I've ever seen. Uh, well, Siberia, that would be up in northern Botswana. And it's not so much a single gathering as a different herds coming down to drink during the dry season. But uh, between the two camps I grew up, right up in the north of Botswana, um, I've seen up to easily over 1,500 to 2,000 elephants in an afternoon. Look at that. I didn't even notice that. It's all happening here today, guys. And some birds we haven't seen for a while due to the lack of water. And they look like they've been resting. You can see them here, don't you? Dead tree. There's a pair of saddle built stalks. I'm going to try and get you a better view while we wait for these elephants to come join us and maybe see if we can also find. Oh, just hang on. He's going to chase him. That Ellie's going to chase the buffalo. So that's, that bull looks like he's up to cause him trouble. And you can just see by his head how, how he's holding his head. There we go. Look at that! Look at him! He's herding buffalo! <laughs> He's just doing it for pure enjoyment. <laughs> and he doesn't really pose any threat to the buffalo. I think he's just having a bit of fun. But isn't that wonderful? Oh! Hey, the zebra we were requesting, I said I hope there would be some zebra in this area. You see them there, Andrew? Disappearing through. And one baby. And one baby. Where are those stalks now? It's just all, we don't know where to look. There's buffalo here. The elephants are going to hopefully pop up behind us just now. Oh, that zebra has given the buffalo the fright of its life. They think it's a lion, but it's not. It's a striped donkey. Look at that, this is a zebra charging across the open area. Has given the buffalo a fright. They took off like they were being chased by a lion. But that zebra is running to the ones we heard calling a little bit earlier. And look at the buffalo, they're looking very sheepish. Like, well, what was that? There's, there's no lion? What was he running from? More elephants trumpeting behind us as well. Lots happening around here. Hello, flows. Silly creatures. So, 
like with a lot of herd animals, even though a single buffalo bull will often stand down. Look at that, a stampeding herd of buffalo. Mm. So they're all nervous after that zebra came charging through. You can tell they've tightened up as a group. Okay, we'll leave them be after their fright of their lives. Let's go back and see if we can find those saddlebull stalks and those zebra. zebra calling and this guy obviously feeling quite lonely heard the rest of the herd and came charging through before we head on to find the zebra there we go a resting pair of saddle bull stalks it almost looks like they are but you can see how the one is looking quite short so it's actually sitting on its knees and that's how they quite often will sleep. So apparently there's also a marabou stalk on the dam cam. So stalks are out and about. And we can see the male and female both here. And I'm waiting to hear what bird, before I ask you another question, is that predatory bird we saw a bit earlier. Oh, and we've got baby warthogs as well. See them through there, Andrew? Uh, you got them. No? There we go. A warthog female. With the babies, some zebras just to the left of them. Hornbills making a racket. Let's see if we can get a bit closer to that zebra and baby warthog. Zebra. So Benjamin says he thinks it might have been a battalier. Uh, you're in the right family, Benjamin, but with the wrong species. It wasn't a battalier, but a battalier is a member of the what eagles, Andrew? Eagle. No, Andrew, no. Snake eagles, Andrew. Snake eagles. So battalier is a member of the snake eagles. Just trying to find those little warthogs. Delectable little piglets. There they go. Zebra. Where are the little piggies going? Ah, there. Oh, they're not in the best spot. They're hiding. Well, let's go have a look at the zebra falls. Oh, and there the Ellie's coming out in front of Andrew as well. It's 
sure happening here. Hello, Wendy fans. They took a slightly different route. Nice, big herd. I did see there were some tiny little ones in that herd. So they're crossing onto Juma at the moment. So they're probably going to cross this road in front of us. Once they get into this block, which is quite thicker, they're going to spread out and start feeding. There's a young bull about there. He comes into screen from the left. Young bull chewing on what looks to be a terminalia. And there you go. He's got another one now. Oh, he decided he didn't want to eat that one. In low range when driving up to elephants, it keeps your revs nice and even, keeps the animals nice and relaxed. They're definitely on a mission. They're not moving away from us, they're just moving. I think they will really want to get into this block to get some food. Little one about to come, and from the left, Andrew. Tiny little guy. A month or two old, there he goes, into the road. Do, 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 And isn't this awesome? You can see they're paying zero attention to us. They're just really keen to get in here. And I can almost see them slow down and start spreading out once they've crossed the road into this thick block between Aubrey's and Sandy Patch. And the last two stragglers. Now, you saw how they were moving with such determination. Really fast walk. And we'll check here now. As they've crossed into this area, as I predicted, where they want to feed, they're starting to spread out. You can see they're moving really slowly now and just stopping and feeding as they go. And we've got another straggler, a young bull. Boy, eh? cut them off at all and the herd is now really slowed down stopped started feeding and he looks like he's about to do the same the young bulls are often on the peripheries of the herds the cows don't like it when they cause trouble with all that testosterone running through their veins Yeah, 
go. You can see they've slowed down, started feeding. Marcel on YouTube says it's so funny that they would charge buffaloes but run screaming when they see a, a mouse. Well, Marcel, that is unfortunately a very old wives' tale. Elephants don't run screaming from rodents. Uh, I'm not quite sure how that myth started it, uh, but I, an elephant would not go run screaming from a little mouse, I'm afraid. But as those eddies move into the thicket, we're going to move along and let's head our way back towards those Nkaruma ladies to see if they're still lying up in the same place. head off uh, to look at those more than likely flat felines. Uh, let's go see what James is up to on Shanks. Hello everybody. Just walking sort of slowly back towards the camp now. We were a long way from home at Twin Dams and if we stop and listen here the, there's a great chorus of rattling sisticulars that has started up <laughs> and I think possibly because they're alarming at us. Let's continue along here. We're just coming towards the drainage line that, well, it's the, one of the major tributaries of the Umlulwati, and it's the one on which our borehole sits. Now, the drought is not only playing havoc with the animals out here. Just quickly, sorry. We were asked about a milk weed just now, and I wanted to make sure that it wasn't a milk berry that you were looking for, Annie. And so here it is. This is the milkberry, Manalcara machisa. It's my favorite tree out here. When they get big, they form these, they're like perfect sort of fairy trees. You'd imagine that all sorts of hobbits and things would really enjoy living in a Manalcara machisa or low felt milkberry. Anyway, as I was saying, it's not only the animals that are going to struggle as a result of this drought, we might also, the hole here is starting to run dry. Now, as we all know, the human body can only survive, I think it's three days, maybe four, without water before it will collapse. And so when the borehole runs dry, we'll probably only broadcast for another three days or so, after which we'll probably have to seek water. I am kidding. There is a backup borehole which we hope has got some water in it. So here's the pump that we have to start. <clears throat> and it's an old, it's an old um, diesel pump, which you can hear from roughly 35 kilometers away. And we're having to run it actually during game drive time. Normally we don't because it makes a big noise, but we're having to do that now because, well, most of it is not running now but because the water is so low. Now, in this dip, of course, is a very famous tree here. So famous because I didn't know it existed on this particular reserve, and Raisa and Jeffrey explained that it did. And it hasn't flowered yet. You both asked to see it flower, and you both asked to see its fruits. Now, that's a sausage tree there, Kegelia africana, and it produces an enormous pod that well, it looks a little bit like a large knookwurst, I suppose, and some beautiful red flowers. And if I'm not mistaken, they're pollinated by bats. But I think the dryness, again, has precluded the formation of those flowers and those fruits, unless it, it requires, perhaps, uh, another tree. So maybe it's only the females. I don't, I don't know if it's monoecious or dioecious, so bisexual or unsexual. Ah, trud or trub on Twitter. Very nice question. You want to know about scorpions and what the rule is regarding 
whether a scorpion is venomous or not. Um, the general rule is if it has got a thick tail and thin pincers, then it's going to be venomous because it uses the thick, to thick tail as obviously a more dramatic or more useful weapon. Then if it's got big fat pincers and a thin tail, obviously it uses its pincers much more to catch its prey. I just want to show you something here. This is a bracket fungus. We were chatting about funguses a little bit earlier and you can see this bracket fungus that has grown out of what looks like I can't believe this is a leadwood tree, but it might be a leadwood tree that has fallen over. It's certainly very, very hard. And you can see it's been chopped and probably pulled out of the road. Big leadwood tree, and that's a bracket fungus that grew there. And I think it's, it's gone, I'm sure it's dead now because it's almost as hard as the wood is. Isn't that amazing? It's called a bracket because it looks like a shelf, obviously. Fascinating. Right, on we go. The other thing about that sausage tree, of course, is um, because the fruits look, well, they look slightly phallic, I suppose, they are used traditionally in some parts of Africa in order to, uh, if you are feeling that you're not quite well endowed enough, then you can use the Kigilia africana tree, or the, the, the cream that comes out of it, uh, to augment yourself, if you so desire. They also use that cream that's very kind of... Um, it's a, quite a nice, pleasant smelling cream that comes out of the, the fruit. They use it in various cosmetics as well. And whether it actually has any effect on the condition of your skin, I'm not sure. I'm fairly sure that the former use I described to you is uh, apocryphal. Can we try these tracks here? I don't know if you'd be able to pick them up there, Brian. Off the lights, too bad. Can you do that? Well, this track here is the track of a civet, which is a nocturnal animal, most closely related to mongoose, probably, from a family called the Viveridae. And it looks almost like a mini hyena track. It's got little claws in the front, it's got fairly kidney shaped pads and that's the civet. And we don't see them often because we're not active too much at night. But in the mornings, the roads are always covered in those civet tracks. Um, sorry, Jerry, can you go again with that last question? It slipped my mind entirely. Jerry did ask a question. It was a great, very good question from Christopher, but I've forgotten precisely what it was. I feel like it's coming back to me, even though Jerry is clearly ignoring me. Oh, there we go, she's back. Ah, yes, you want to know about artifacts and if we've ever found some interesting artifacts. Yes, Christopher, um, you can sometimes find sort of stone shavings and stone chips that may or may not have been used by people, Stone Age people in the area to cut things from. Um, I think a lot of the time we find a sharp stone and we say, oh, look, there's a flint, or something like that, when actually it's just a piece of stone that's cracked off something. But what we do find, if you look at this termite mound here, sometimes you'll find, and these are not very ancient artifacts that I'm going to describe to you, you find pots inside the termite mounds, sort of whole clay pots, and very long buried in the termite mound, probably not more than sort of 50 to 100 years old, I would say. Maybe a little bit older, maybe up to 200 years old. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, they contained um, some kind of medicine. They wouldn't have contained ashes or anything like that because people out here um, are totally appalled by the thought of cremation. So it would have been something, I think it had something to do with the tribute to the ancestors, if I'm not mistaken. Steph, was that, was that your understanding? You've obviously found them before. Yeah, um, I also heard that recently they used to use them as a type of bank. You know, right. Very, very well. Okay. So I don't know if you heard that microphone sitting here, of course. Steph said that it was also used as a kind of bank. So people would put their valuables in these pots and then put them in the termite mounds and hide them. So interesting that. So those are the main artifacts that we found here. All around the Kruger Park, though, you do find evidence of Stone Age um, in habitation here. And so there were definitely lots and lots of Stone Age people here. And the most interesting thing I ever found was a, it was a circular stone 
that I think was used on the end of a digging stick. So you find the big, it's heavy circular stone with a hole in the middle of it. And that hole, you would then put the thing, you'd, you'd slip that disc onto a stick like this, and then you'd, you'd dig with it, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't come off because your stick would be thicker and it would hold it then, so you'd use that as a kind of digging stick. And that's the most interesting thing that I found out here. Oh, thank you, James Richard. You want to know about my skin after my little my mud cosmetic treatment yesterday evening. Um, James, I'm going to let you decide. Hold on, let me decide. What do you think, Brian? Do I look absolutely beautiful? Thank you, thank you. Wonderful. Jerry says I look the same. Right, we're going to wrap the bushwalk, send you back to Brent for the last few minutes. Big thanks to Brian. Thank you, Brian, for Thank carrying you, all the pack. Thank you, Steph, for your efforts on security. And an enormous happy birthday to Geraldine Kent, now aged 18. Happy birthday, Jerry! Happy birthday, Jerry! Yay. Back to Brent. So here we go. One of the lionesses just got up and is now returning to the deep shade where she's going to spend the rest of the day. I doubt the Nkuma Pride's going to move very far from here, but exciting stuff. Definitely going to be around for the Sunset Safari. Oh, a little bit of movement. And it doesn't look like they managed to catch anything last night, so maybe that little herd of buffalo we just saw might meander down towards this area. And as I was saying, the sound of a herd of buffalo is the equivalent to the ice cream truck coming past for small children. Except fortunately the lions go out and get their own ice cream, we don't have to provide it for them. As you can see as it's getting warmer they're moving into the deeper and deeper shade and it is going to be very interesting to see what happens on this evening safari. So Sherry in California is wondering, do we keep track of the numbers of things like lions? Because of course there's only about 18 to 20,000 wild lions left in Africa and they are one of the species that is under threat at the moment. We do and all that is logged into a, a, a website that goes onto the Panthera or the Panthera website, and that data is uh, gathered by the scientists, and they do keep a, a careful look on all that type of stuff. So we do uh, all predators. There's a Eurasian hobby falcon. Uh, quickly, 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 quickly. That's a very new bird. Oh, it's disappearing. A Eurasian hobby. I don't know if you guys managed to get. I don't know if we can count that as a tick, but there have been a few of them around, and that's the first one that's literally come to show us itself there we go look at that isn't that beautiful uh, i know i'm now going to ex going over town a little bit but so there we go hopefully a really nice new uh, bird for your bird lists out there and i know it's one you guys definitely haven't got before so thanks very much for joining us on this epic sunrise safari and don't forget to join us in a few short hours for the sunset safari where i'm definitely going to be back with the lions seeing what they get up to uh, jamie's going to be joining me Hopefully there will be a plethora of animals out there for us to see. So goodbye for now, and we'll see you in a few hours.